hey guys in this video we're going to be going over everything you need for cell level systems the first unit in biology for ocr gateway gcse science now to go with this there's a free revision guide which you can download from my website and thousands of multiple choice questions to help you revise My coscrew techniques have varied wildly over the time. From the very, very basic starts where you had your lenses and you had to use the focus to see what was going on. These are all generally hand done, very, very basics. To ones that you're probably more familiar with in school which have slightly more sophisticated lenses. To the massive ones that I used to work on, um, electron microscopes, where they're all controlled by computer. If you want to work out image heights, object heights or magnification from an image you've taken from a microscope, the calculation is magnification equals image height over object height. We've heard of metres which are incredibly long, you're probably between one and two metres tall. And we can have smaller parts of metre, for example a centimetre on my screen is about that big. And that is one times 10 to the minus 2 metres. A millimetre is even smaller. That's 1 times 10 to the minus 3 metres. A micrometre is 1 times 10 to the minus 6 metres. A nanometer is 1 times 10 to the minus 9 metres. And a picometer is 1 times 10 to the minus 12 metres. So if our metre is going to be M, our centimetre is CM, our millimetre is MM, our micrometre is a mu M, nanometre NM and picometre PM. As you can see, measuring very, very small things in metres wouldn't be a very useful way of measuring them. Even though you have to learn the structure of a typical plant cell or a typical animal cell, there isn't really a typical type of cell because there are a wide range of differentiated specialised cells. We can see here in our cross section of the leaf, it has lots of different types of cells in. Here we have a neuron, which looks very different to a muscle cell which is going to look very different to a skin cell or very different to a set of cells in the gut. They're going to be specialised to do their jobs. So here we have villi, which give us long surface area. Here the cells are very tall to provide structure. Here the cells have a very long body so that the neurons can travel a long distance. And the muscle cells are going to stretch and contract. Here we have our beautiful plant cell with a cell membrane that's responsible for determining which bits go in and out of the cell. A cell wall, important for structure. The vacuole, important for structure. The cytoplasm, where most of the reactions take place. The tiny little dots are the ribosomes which are responsible for protein synthesis, the green bits, or the chloroplasts. The pink ones are the mitochondria, where um, energy is produced. And then last but not least, we have our nucleus. Here we have our animal cell with our cell membrane. Again, controlling what goes in and out, our mitochondria. where energy is produced, ribosomes, which are responsible for protein synthesis, cytoplasm, where most of the reactions take place, and our nucleus, where is the, that's where the DNA is held, and that's a control centre of the cell. You'll notice there are several features of a plant cell that an animal cell doesn't share. For example, the cell wall, the vacuole, the chloroplasts. If you want to copy these pictures yourself, you can download them in the free version guide from my website. Here we have our bacterial cell, which has its 
cell membrane controlling what goes in and out, the cytoplasm where most of the reactions take place, the chromosome, the DNA not in a nucleus, the flagella which is used for um, locomotion, ribosomes for protein synthesis and then on the outside we have the cell wall. DNA is made from different bases that fit together. So we are always going to have A connecting to T and we are always going to have C connecting to G. This is always, always, always going to be the case. It has a sugar phosphate backbone and there are two of those which stretch all the way around the outside. There are two of those. It is a double helix. You see that the green is always connected to the yellow, A to T, C to G. The blue is always connected to the orange. And it's going round in a helical or a double helical structure. DNA is a long strand of deoxyribonucleic acid made up of lots of letters, A's, T's, C's and G's. And these twist round into a double helix. This double helix is still ridiculously long so it further twists rounds so that it's in a chromosome. And this chromosome is located in the nucleus of a cell. Each three letter sequence of DNA is going to code for an amino acid. So here we have A, G, A. We start off with A, find G, then find A. So that DNA sequence is going to code into the amino acid arginine. The next three along, C, T, G, are going to code into leucine. And this will keep going until eventually we have a long amino acid chain. This can then fold up in very complicated ways until we get a protein that will look something like that. And proteins are responsible for basically everything that happens in your body. They are the hormones, they are the enzyme, they are the cell walls. Everything is a protein or dependent upon a protein. And these proteins are very, very specific. An enzyme substrate's active site is going to be very, very specific to the substrate. So if there is a mistake in our amino acid chain, if something is missing or if something is wrong, we put the wrong amino acid in there, then our enzyme, our protein, is going to fold up wrong. The mutation is going to have caused a change in the protein, which can then have a massive impact on how it functions meaning that it might not work properly, meaning that it might not break down what it's supposed to break down, meaning that it might not function in the correct way. There is a massive amount of DNA in each of our cells and only some of it is useful. So say this section here might be non-coding, which basically means it's like junk DNA just getting in the way. Amylase, proteas and lipase are all enzymes and work with the LEC and key mechanism. We have our enzyme which has a very specifically shaped active site. So only one substrate or a couple of substrates are going to fit in there, the ones that have the complementary site. They're going to form an enzyme substrate complex and then the enzyme is either going to break apart things or it is going to join together things. It is then going to release the product and then the enzyme is unchanged and can be used again. You need to know how and temperature affects enzyme activity and it is this kind of lopsided curve. When we have really, really low temperatures, there is not enough energy. At the peak, this is the optimal temperature. And then after the peak, the enzymes get denatured. 
which means the links between them holding everything together are being destroyed. The enzyme is not killed. I know the temptation is to say this, but the correct term is denatured. Our curve for pH is much more symmetrical. We still have an optimal pH. But when it is too high or too low, the bonds aren't going to be in place. So the active site of the enzyme is going to be broken down. So again, it is going to be denatured. There are only a certain number of active sites on an enzyme. So once they are full up, the enzyme activity can't keep increasing. So while they are filling up, the enzyme activity will increase the substrate concentration, but when they are full up, increasing the substrate concentration won't increase the enzyme activity any further. An enzyme can be used as a catalyst for a rate of reaction. What we will see is that reaction will start to happen much faster, but it will end up at the same point. The reaction will probably end faster. This is because there are going to be other limiting factors like enzyme concentration, substrate concentration or reactant concentration. For respiration, we are going to take glucose, add it to oxygen and come out with water and carbon dioxide. You need to know the symbols for these, so oxygen is O2, water, H2O, carbon dioxide, CO2, and glucose, C6H12O6. This needs to be balanced, but it's a nice easy one, 6, 6, 6. You have to make sure your numbers are the right size and in the right place. So these ones need to be little numbers and these ones need to be big numbers. Respiration is an exothermic reaction, which means energy is given out. The best example we can see of respiration is screaming jelly baby demo where we take potassium chlorate, that's our liquid oxygen, add in our glucose, that's our jelly baby, and you can see the massive amount of energy that comes off it. Anaerobic means without oxygen. So for anaerobic respiration, we take glucose, and we turn it into energy and lactic acid. Not as much energy as aerobic respiration. because the glucose isn't fully broken down. The lactic acid is going to build up in muscles. Causing an oxygen debt. This build up is going to be quite painful. So you'll get it when you're doing things like sprinting um, or when you run out of oxygen. So after you've finished um, sprinting, after you've finished wanting to get rid of this oxygen debt, you're going to need to breathe really, really hard. That's why you, you, you pant. You keep breathing hard after you're running to pay back this oxygen debt to get the blood flowing, to remove the lactic acid from your muscles. Anaerobic respiration can also take place in yeast. So yeast will take the glucose and we'll convert it into carbon dioxide and ethanol. Ethanol is used in drinks and cleaning products. 
and carbon dioxide, e.g. for a variety of things. But when we're talking about uh, in context of yeast, that is what's going to make your cakes or your bread rise. There are a number of different enzymes in the digestive system that you need to be aware of. Lipase breaks down fats into fatty acids and glycerol. It is made in the pancreas and small intestine and works in the small intestine. Protease breaks down proteins into amino acids. It is made in the stomach, pancreas, and small intestine, and works in the stomach and small intestine. Amylase breaks down starch into sugars. It is made in the salivary glands, pancreas, and small intestine. And it works in the mouth and small intestine. You need to know how to test for fats, starch, sugars and proteins. Fats can be tested for using the emulsion test or the filter paper test. For the emulsion test you add ethanol, shake it, Add water and look for a colour change. If it goes cloudy, then lipids are present. With the filter paper test, if you rub it on filter paper, the filter paper should go see through. To test the starch, you add iodine. And if starch is present, it is going to go dark black, dark blue colour, that means it's going to be a positive result. To test for addition of sugars we can act, add Benedict solution heat it for two minutes um, in a water bath and if it goes red if there's lots of sugar or kind of like a pale green yellow if there's a little bit of sugar. We can test protein with the burette's test so we add we add burette solution and it will go purple if it is present. Photosynthesis is going to take water, carbon dioxide, and turn it into oxygen and glucose. We can take light and we can put it above the equation, but do not put it in the equation because it is not a reactant. It's just a condition that's needed. You also need to know the symbols for these. So water is H2O plus carbon dioxide, which is CO2. Goes to oxygen, O2 plus glucose, which is C6H12O6. This needs to be balanced, but it's a nice easy one to balance because it is 666. So you can just remember that it's 666. And when you're writing out your formula, make sure your numbers are little and are in the correct place. Because if you write this, that's wrong, that's wrong and you will lose the marks. 
in photosynthesis, we are taking energy from here, we're taking energy from light, and we are locking it up in glucose. This is an endothermic reaction. It takes in energy. There are certain requirements for photosynthesis. First of all, we are going to need chlorophyll. That is our green pigment in leaves. We're going to need water and carbon dioxide because they are our reactants. And then we're going to need sunlight. And the levels of these can greatly affect how much photosynthesis takes place. The rate of photosynthesis is going to depend on the percentage level of carbon dioxide. As the percentage level of carbon dioxide increases, so the rate of photosynthesis is going to increase, but only up to a point. After this point, there are going to be other limiting factors. Past this point, we need to increase something like the water, light or the temperature if we want more photosynthesis to take place. We could easily switch this out to the percentage level of water and the graph would look the same. Light intensity is important for the rate of photosynthesis. When it is night time, when it is dark, we do not have a lot of photosynthesis going on. As we get further through the day, as we get more light intensity, the rate of photosynthesis will increase until we get to a point where it is no longer the limiting factor and other things like the reactants or temperature need to be increased. After this point, we need to think about increasing other things. Now, even though the graph is flat here, it looks like it might have stopped. It hasn't. There is still a steady rate of photosynthesis. It's just not increasing as much as it was down here. It's just a steady rate. When plants are very, very cold, everything acts very, very slowly. Not a lot happens. It slowly increases until a nice point where the enzymes are happy and there's lots and lots of photosynthesis going on until it gets too hot and they start to be denatured and then the rate will fall off very rapidly. So we have our rate of reaction increasing the temperature and our optimal temperature and our enzymes getting denatured. It's really important that you remember that the enzymes are denatured, they are not killed, they are denatured. The actual um, rate of photosynthesis that takes place is much more complicated than depending on just one thing. It's going to depend on lots of different things all at once. The glucose from photosynthesis is going to be stored as starch. The most obvious example of starch is going to be potatoes. Ouch! This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches.